I'm going to call this to order. And note this is the uh, Committee on Rules, Orders, Appointments, and Ordinances. And that's about, well, this is our September 22nd meeting. We're now in session. I see we're all here, so we have 100% attendance. I'm going to announce that Pam is taking notes. North Street is videoing us from the front side. Comcast is videoing us from the back side. So I think we're 100% covered. <laughs> but, but just to be aware, every you word for word, you'll not just be paraphrased. You'll be covered in two directions. So um, do we have a motion to approve our minutes from July 14th? Uh, so moved. Second. Second. Any discussion on minutes? All in favor? Aye. So we're going to kind of hop around. Um, on our agenda a little bit till Carolyn gets here to address the uh, public hearing stuff. And we have some appointments and some other things to do that will keep us busy for a little while, at the very least. Um, so let's do our appointments first. We have a new appointment to the Housing Partnership. And I think, you can find my notes from last time. Who was I, I, I spoke to um, NTA. Was it and, a successful um, interview? And, uh, absolutely, she's um, she has experience um, in this kind of uh, in this kind of work, a number of internships, and also background in planning, and I think just the dedication to the job. So I I think she'd be good mm -hmm. on the housing partnership. Do you want to move for approval of her? Yeah, yeah I, I move for. Uh, second. I'll second that. Any more discussion on this one? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So now the Arts Council. Um, I spoke oh, with Mr. Zuckerman. You did? And I could speak to his appointment if you would sure. like. Okay. So uh, you all had a chance to see the application from Jonah Zuckerman, who's uh, been now in Northampton for a few years. He moved up here from Brooklyn, New York. We're very active um, in the community in a kind of public art. Uh, respect and can be credited for much of the changes in those parts of that um, section of, of Brooklyn. Um, it runs a, it worked for many years in an architectural firm and now does uh, furniture design at a workshop out of East Hampton, but is very interested in the in, uh, active in the community. Um, had actually expressed interest not only in the Arts Council but also in the Planning Board. Uh, his um, well, I'm sure he'd be you know, a great asset to any board that we have in the city, while his strengths clearly are um, given his educational background in design and architecture and real uh, love of art, especially interested, he said, in visual arts, public art. Um, and a, a, a real fresh uh, view in Northampton, having really not much understanding of the background and history of the Arts Council. In some ways, I thought that that's actually really, can be a, a real benefit coming into that board. So I speak highly of his appointment to the board and would move to recommend the positive. I, I see his choices were the Arts Council or the Planning Board. And I think we're doing a great favor of putting him on the Arts Council. I'm <laughs> <laughs> doing the city favor. I'm doing the city favor too. All right. So, um, all in favor of Mr. Zuckerman? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, the next two I spoke to, I spoke to uh, uh, Herbert Hank Ross. He was one of the two infamous Ross brothers. Ah. Yeah. He and his uh, brother Robert were the infamous Ross brothers. There's only one now. Hank is actually in real estate business. Though he still does in, in deep things for particular and he was raised in Massachusetts, but he's lived here like 37 years. So, and he's actually um, been kind of like an associate member there for a while. So he's been around that board. Um, he and Bob are friends, so he was quite, he's been quite involved for a while. And it was a very good interview, so I would recommend him and move him for approval for the Arts Council. I'll second that. Uh, any more conversation about Mr. Ross? All in favor? Aye. And then uh, Jean Paul, I also spoke to. Um, he is also from New York, but from Yonkers, same area. He's been here a year. Um, and only selected the Arts Council. We had a very nice conversation, and he has quite a resume. He's working, I think, for the Springfield Public Schools now. I think he's in education there. 
has clearly had a decent background in the arts, lives and working. And based on our interview, I think he'd be a fine member, so I would move we approve his application as well. Second. Any more discussion on it? John Paul? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 And then who called this Amber? I think one of us was supposed to call this Amber. It must be. Uh, oh, well. Was it? I don't know. You know, I hope it wasn't. I know I, I, knew was, I had I knew yeah. I had Mr. Zuckerman. Actually, in my is, is Cassandra a new one? She wasn't on our list from last time. No, she just came up at, at the last uh, meeting. this last meeting. Okay, okay, so, okay, so she is to be contacted by us. Right. Okay. Right. Well, I do do so. Well, okay. actually, if you'd like to, because Prospect Street, she might be. Oh, do you know where she is? I'm, I don't mind one. speaking to her. We, she's one of your experience. I think so. Yeah. Nice to have Because I noticed, I'm looking at the old agenda too, and those were from our previous meeting. The only other one um, from our previous meeting there. is Ellen um, from Crescent Street. And I think we. we I've spoken to her numerous times right. about this. And, and I think well we needed people. to vote to approve her, but I think everybody knew her well enough in her time on that committee to yeah. not need to call her. So do you want to move her? I would move gladly, Ellen Augard. Second. Okay, any more discussion on that one? All in favor? Aye. Okay. And so the rest of them then, the Rec Commission and Cassandra are new. So we need we need to call them and either offer them the chance to come in and visit us or just interview them on the telephone. Um, um Julia Chega, I know very well if you want me to have a conversation with her. With Julia, the next okay. week, I'd be happy to. Good. I know she's out of the country for a couple of weeks. Maybe at least a couple mm -hmm. weeks still. Okay. Well, then I, I'm happy to call Yvonne. Yes. And then do you want to call Alexis? No, I'm happy to. Okay, call her. All right, so we'll split those three up. So okay, I'm so am I going to make a note? I, I would be speaking to Cassandra and Julia. Okay, and then I'll do Yvonne and you're going to do Alexis. Excellent. Okay, so that's our appointments from last time and new referrals from this time. So we've got that. A quick question, um, just so I know the time frame. Are we meeting again in October 2nd? Uh, 13th, I think. It was and that's not Columbus Day? Oops. But I just be. know that usually the second Monday is Columbus Day. Is it? Yeah, it is. Okay. And would we like to just meet another day that, yeah. that week? Or, or the, either that or the day? next Monday. First Monday. Monday. But yeah, the next Monday, that would be the well, first is public safety, which ties us up. Yep, so the 20th instead, just, just so I know. Mm -hmm. I think we didn't have a, we sometimes lose our room to the license commission. Okay, let me we'll just check and see what else is. So or whatever your danger is. Yeah, the 13th is uh, August day. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know when we change the nights, we get trouble. So the Committee on Social Services meets on the 20th. At what time? 4 to 6.30. Okay. Well, we could meet here, yeah. If this is yeah, why don't we do this, if this is from available, we could come over here on the 20th at our normal 5 o'clock time. I can't be a photo, oh. so you're oh, you have to over there. The we could tentatively schedule the 20th because I know they have that public hearing on the 14th. Yes. On the 14th. So I don't know if they're still planning to have this Another meeting after. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we don't switch days. We need to check and see if we conflict with anything. And then me, I have to just take a quick look and see. So, so like maybe on the 14th instead, I know. I can't. Oh no, the 14th is that hearing, so I can't do the 14th. Uh, if you want to just look at that week, at 15th is hard mm -hmm. to 16th constantly. I think we're better off trying to stick to that Monday, the 20th. Um, and see if they're, to see if they're meeting, because that would make the most sense to do it, just do it the next Monday. And then everybody's free as long as they're not. We could bump up our time. I know that would be back to back for you. I don't care about that. That's well, because we'd like be saving you. Like maybe we could meet at six instead. Do they usually go the full five to six? <laughs> yeah. They do. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, How about at seven? I know that's late. Mm -hmm. That's fine for me. I don't care. Mm -hmm. 
No, it's, 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 we stay up late, so. It's the 28th at 7? Why don't we schedule it for that day and then confirm the time. Okay. when they're meeting, because if they're not meeting because they just had, they just had their hearing, then we can slip forward, but if not. Okay, so I'll say, I have it right now at 5, and then if, if we have to Pick it up to 6, it's 6.30, right, when they end. Yeah, you got to let her get a, a cup of coffee at 20%. 6.30 to 7? Yeah. All right, we'd rather, would you, I'm, I'm yeah, deferring to you, we'd rather go right at 6.30? Yeah, that's fine. 6.30 would be good for you know, We'll change, we'll change over. Okay. And then we'll kick it up to 5 if, if there is no meeting. Okay, we'll, so... Will some of this depend on whether you have a public hearing scheduled for that night? Oh, or we, we will needs? definitely. Okay, so, so uh, I don't know if 6.30 is a good time for public. everyone else who needs to participate. Mm -hmm. Well, not the public, oh, but Carol. No, it Carol. will be. It is what it is, and she theoretically is going to be here. Okay. So we can check with her to see if that works. Okay. Yeah, we see that. So either 5 or 6.30 is then. Okay, that was October. Right. I'm sorry I, I put us into that topic. I was just trying to figure out what our time frame then mm -hmm. for me to bring back a report on Cassandra and Julia. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cassandra and Julia. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Julia. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, that really takes us up to everything that's on our agenda for public hearings. Well, uh, let me point something out. I, I believe items 10 through 16 are not part of the public hearing. That was the one. I think these are all like oh, transportation yeah. parking and uh, the bike lane. The plastic bag thing. Yeah, I don't think they're part of the public hearing. And we have to we have to postpone we could just uh, postpone the plastic bag thing anyway because we'll always take that we, last. It's gone to lots of different places. So. We want to just continue I'll we'll move to continue that well, well let's just start on 10 and go through. Yeah. And, and some of these things are things that you have expertise in because they would have come back from transportation. But you guys have sponsors, right? We'll, we'll see if I do. Okay. So, um, we, well, let's just continue to get on the way. Um, so, 312 80, the bike lanes on North Main Street and Prospect Street. That came from you. It did, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the listen, uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah, received a positive recommendation from the Transportation Parking Commission. It essentially adds two new stretches of, of bike lane, one along Prospect Street and one um, up on North Main Street uh, towards, you know, towards the east. And um, it's kind of funny because they already painted the Prospect Street. <laughs> <laughs> so we could choose to vote no. And, and, yeah. um, but uh, yeah, and, and these, these are two new bike lanes along uh, important routes. So that's why I received a positive recommendation. I, I would move the Second. Do you have a second on that? Is there any more discussion on the two bike lanes? Then all in favor of a positive recommendation say aye. 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 Good. Get that one done. And then uh, parking, this is 312-102, parking prohibited on all times on Main Street forms. I'd like to move we take 10, excuse me, 10, 11, 11 and 12 as a group. Okay. Because they do the same thing. Do you want to you want to why don't you move them as a group and we'll get them seconded in there? So I move on this group. Well, second. Okay. So that's 312, 102, 312, 104, and 312. No, other parts of 104. There's two 104s. Okay. Are you good? I, I want okay. Yeah, so yeah, there's there's yeah. The ones I want to move are 312, 104, 312, 102. But only items 11 and 12. Only yeah, items 11 and 12. Yeah. That was a different part. Okay. We have a second for those. So go ahead if you want to. Again, because they come sure, from your absolutely. other committee, you know what they're Absolutely. Doing. So basically, this um, first um, changes where parking is prohibited and then designates one hour parking along the same block in Florence in front of Cooper's Corner. Mm -hmm. Right now, you may know that it's actually prohibited to park in front of Cooper's Corner. <laughs> Where the, where the parking spaces are? Where people actually park, yeah. And yeah, there's marked spaces. And yeah, and there are marked spaces. So we uh, put into law that it's not <laughs> illegal, and you may park there. Can you just, what, what, was the re 
um, was it prohibited at some point for some reason? It is, oh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, the history of it, I don't yeah. know. Because we just like the streets that weren't streets. Nobody exactly. ever got around to yeah. The streets that weren't streets. Or, that nobody oh, knew about okay. It's right. so not right on uh, Main Street. Yeah, Main it, it, it's right on Main Street. Yeah, yeah right from the first people park. So it essentially undoes the prohibition and designates those spaces as one hour parking spaces to conform with reality. So I think it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I would probably agree with those. Okay, second for those. Any further discussion on those? All in favor of a positive recommendation? Aye. Okay. And now we have the next two. Okay, so that's 112, 104, and 112, 109. And um, this, this is a big one. Yeah, th this is interesting. These two go together as well. Basically, um, unlike other parking designations in the city, like handicapped parking spaces, or as you just saw, the one hour parking, 15 minute spaces are not written into the code. They were just kind of administratively designated. Um, so this would change that and then enumerate where all the 15 minute spaces are in the city, um, which I think is appropriate. Um, that should be in the code of ordinances rather than said administratively. So what you have is a list of all these pretty much downtown mm -hmm. uh, 15 minute spots. And those are designated under the limited time parking set schedule. Mm -hmm. And the companion one simply um, adds the phrase, unless otherwise specified, um, when those stretches of, of parking spaces are in different parts, different uh, you know, lengths of time. For example, Armory Street, there's two-hour parking in some of it, um, except for the 15 minute spot, so it creates an exception. Um, hope that was clear. But they, they come together. Can we just put, is that one of yeah. our pieces here? Just, you want uh, to take Well, I've got one. I just want to see which one it is. Oh, I see. It's this thing here. This, two, this stapled one? There's a stapled one. Yep. And it's on the bottom. It's 14-219. Right. And then 14.220. So they codify where all the 15 minute parking spaces are. On the bottom of this chart? No, on the, on the, on the bottom of, of the, the document. agenda? Of the document. Yeah, because one of them is just all the 15 minute spaces. Right there. Yeah. Sorry, just with so many here, it's hard to tell which one we're referring to. It is the stable one. <coughs> okay. Um, and at the end of the footer down here yes. is 14.21. Yes. Oh, okay. Now I see that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Exactly. And the companion one is one page and it's 14.220. Okay. Any further discussion? So if I, you know, please let me know if there's any questions. I didn't describe that clearly enough. That's the purpose of the uh, So we have all these 15 minute spots, and all this is doing is placing this in the and correct spot. The board. Yeah, they just didn't appear in the code before. You mean, as, uh, you mean as specific locations? <coughs> exactly, yeah. We didn't have any 15 minute spots in the code. Oh, okay, so, uh, and so my question was um, again, when these became enacted, the 15 minute spots, which is probably five years ago, so or six? I think it was with the understanding that these would change from time to time based on merchant needs. A lot of them were uh, enacted so that. Yeah. So I, I, I wonder if codifying them as such, well, it just means every time there might be a change based on the need to ever just need to go in and add a location or exactly. delete. And a good example of that, that's a good question, is Main Street Cleaners recently moved, right. not far, but down the street. Um, and so that, that would be reflected in this uh, schedule we had to change those 15 minutes. Uh, yes. Actually, we're uh, adding another one that yeah, we're scaling. Oh, so we added one, and, and we um, are keeping the one. We're keeping the other three that were on the other block. OK, and the one that was in front of Main Street Cleaners will remain. I mean, yeah, I think there were, I think there's actually three there, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they will remain. As I recall, Mr. Lipender at the time thought it was a good idea, so we just put it in the signs to see if it worked. Something like that. And it worked. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah, we never right. had any ordinances to support them. Right, right. Yeah, that was right. But now we do. Good. So, those were moved and seconded, correct? Right? I moved. I'll second it. They weren't seconded. Second. Okay. If there's no more discussion, all in favor of, of those two? I say aye. aye. Okay. Positive recommendation for those two. And then we've got 312.99, number 15 on our list, violations and penalties. <coughs> that would explain that as well. Um, that's this one. This was a suggestion that originally came from Nancy Forrestal, who brought it conceptually to the Transportation and Parking Commission um, with regards to how much the fine is for legally parking in a handicapped parking space. The state range is $100 or $300, and that was updated by the state, I don't know, fairly recently, in the past five years, I think. And that this is another one where we didn't actually have the fine set in law because administrative, we decided it would be $100. So this does two things. One, it sets the fine and clarifies it a little bit, and it raises it, our fine that affect within $100. Raising it to 150, and regionally, you look at other communities in the area, we're low. Um, Amherst, I believe, is 200. Greenfield is 200. I believe South Hadley is 150. So we were on the lower end. Hoyas is 300. So that's what this does. Just sets a new fine. As I recall, um, there was, I'm not sure if it's put into the legislation at all, but I think it was understood that our collection of these fines. Uh, would be for use by the committee on disability? Yes. Okay. Right. So does that need it, it, do we have that? They did that already. Exactly. It's just a matter of policy or yeah. is it something that we yeah, they we and we gave them that permission. In fact, at our last meeting we gave them like a fifteen hundred dollar budget as I recall, so they could they didn't have to come back so for a hundred dollars to right. okay. get a banner or buy coffee or something. I don't know what the mechanism is whereby the money is transferred. That's why it must be in a different area. Separate, yeah, this is just an enumeration of different Yeah, because we had to, I remember when we react, enacted the statute for that, and in fact, they had to redo the committee, as I recall. They had to, in order to get the money, you had to have your committee conform with the state statute, and we didn't, so we had to change oh, okay. our committee around. But we're, we're good now. So. We had to change that yeah, from a commission to a committee. We had to match the state laws requirements. So now these are commissioners, not just, oh, thank you. So they're, they're and I, I don't know, $150. I mean, parking in a handicapped space is one of the nastier things people do. I mean, those are special places for handicapped people, so. I'll, I'll second that um, okay. Any other discussion on? Uh, just, I just I put 150 to start with to be kind of conservative in terms of the fine, in terms of raising it, and I thought the Transportation and Parking Commission should debate it. I was sort of surprised there wasn't that much debate about the amount of mm -hmm. the fine, but they were fine with $150. Oh. That, that was the explanation mm -hmm. All right, and it'll go back to Council, so if Council feels like yeah, it right. should be another number, then crank it up. Did you say the max is 300 though, state? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So we'll see. The council of ours does with this one. Okay. Um, all right, all in favor of positive recommendation on this one? Aye. Aye. Now, 16 looks like it, it, it's gone other places, right? right? That just got referred, so we couldn't be ready for that again. I don't know if So, the solid waste reduction, item 16, yes. was only sent to us last year. That's right, so we'll continue. And that went to other committees. So, we don't need, do we need to continue? Continue yeah. it? Or, yeah. okay, we would continue, continue it to our next meeting on the 20th. And then we just, we just can't. Wait for the other committees to. Right, so we just continue it at each meeting until, because as I pointed until out, the meeting, it's going to be yeah. a year. Oh, good deal. Okay. Okay. And that way, Pam just kicks it on to our next meeting. All right, all in favor of continuing that one? Aye. 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 And then we also should continue the. Um, the plastic bag one. Which that's what we just did. Was yeah. that it? Yeah. Oh, that's it? Okay. It was a fancy name. It's just one name. Solid waste reduction yeah. environment. It sounds like a fe federal legislation. <laughs> so the, the, when a name doesn't sound anything like what you're doing. It's a preamble. Oh, actually, the ordinance is thicker than the Constitution. Okay. 
Okay. I'm sorry, I was working on that. Okay, so that was done. So now we find ourselves. Uh, we need to do public comment for the regular part of our session. Um, we sure could. Is may not be necessary. If anybody wants to do general public comment, we're about to open the public hearings on the zoning, which is I think what everybody's here for. So I'm assuming nobody wanted to make a quick early comment and then exit the stage. Unrelated to that zoning. Unrelated to the zoning. It's looking like that's what everybody's here for. So, um, so we we'll go back to page one. And we'll open our first public hearing, or I'll accept the motion to open the public hearing on um, Amanda 350, uh, 350.12.26 Lighting Standard Review Assessment. Moved to open Second. Okay. All there? Aye. So is there anyone here? Well, actually, let's have Carolyn comment on it first so we all know what we're talking about. Sure. And then we'll take public comment on it. So 12.6 is a proposed amendment to, um, well, it does two things. One is just um, provide in writing um, what the building commissioner already does, but um, he felt like it was important to have um, some clarity for people who are looking in the ordinance um, um, about his jurisdiction to ensure that projects are meeting the current light standard. So um, the ability for him to point to text saying that he can go out, make his own assessment, and if the, the property owner doesn't agree with it, the recourse is the property owner can provide their own professional assessment and they can work out the details. Um, in order to achieve compliance. So it doesn't really change anything in the ordinance, it's just um, he felt more comfortable having that clearly identified. The second piece of it is um, that um, a, a standard to require that site lighting for projects in um, business districts be turned off one hour after the close of business. Um, we're not talking about building lights or entry lights. This is really parking lot lights. Um, and the reason this has come up is that many times planning boards, um, the planning board approves, goes through site plan approval and might attach a condition. That's sort of been the standard is to attach a condition to a site plan approval saying, well, once your business is closed, there's no need to have your whole parking lot lit up for the entire night. Um, so an hour after you're done with business, they should be on a timer and be turned off. But it's been, the planning board has to remember to add that to a condition, so sometimes they haven't. So we have these sort of um, um, irregular standards across the board. So this is really just to say, you know what, we don't need lights on all night long for businesses that are not um, open. Quick question, then. Uh, of course that wouldn't apply to uh, present presently operating businesses. It's only for new plans? Or um, no, it's for all businesses who have big site parking lots. So, mm -hmm. yeah. for example, so Stop and Shop lights will go off now at 1 a.m. or whatever, an hour after they, they close at midnight. So. Right. Mm -hmm. So how does this work with like an auto dealer where they're prone to losing, you know, 25 airbags in the middle of the night or getting their catalytic converters cut off? But we've got comment from the police department and whether they want for security purposes to keep some of these places lit up? Um, no, but we some auto dealers, as they come through, we've had permit conditions that say you can't keep your site lights on or you can have minimal site lights for security purposes. I mean, that's basically an uh, um, a sort of, I would say, more of an administrative function. You could put timer sensor, um, you know, motion detectors on lights so that they come on if there's if there's motion detected. Um, so there are other ways to deal with that, but no, I haven't checked in with the police department about car dealers in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that would be one of the only interest why people keep lights on is to, for security purposes, so that when the police go by, they can see the perimeters of the buildings. And I know they do ask you to even in businesses leave interior lights on so that they, you know, if, if an alarm goes off and they walk up to the window, they can actually see inside, see if things are disturbed. So. Anybody, uh, I don't gather this was the one you're all here for, but anybody want to throw in any public 
since you are a public, we don't sometimes even have one. <laughs> any comment on this one? No, I don't hear I, any. I think it would be prudent to check with the police for security purposes mm -hmm. and domestic violence all kinds of things. And we could uh, we can certainly do that. Just we can, uh, with no other real comment, we can close the public hearing on these and then send it forward and we can have that comment for, uh, for council when it shows up. Let me read the two paragraphs that they're going to insert, just we haven't read them, and I'm sure the folks watching the North Street side will want to know the uh, We are on 350-12.2-6, and the two paragraphs that this would add to the ordinance are, the building commissioner shall determine if light levels are being met. Based on this assessment, the property owner shall replace or modify fixtures to achieve compliance. And I believe this is the ordinance that talks about spillage of light off-site or away from, from the buildings. Is that true, Carolyn? Because I know we have in our ordinance splash from lights. Yeah, and we don't go. allow light levels to spill over on property boundaries anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's really just the, the level of illumination as well as, yeah, if they're mm -hmm. misdirected in some okay. way. Okay. Yeah. And if the property owner disagrees, they can get a lighting engineer to come measure exactly. the light and say, here, we are in right. right. And then the other one is on the one we just talked about. All site lighting not attached to the building itself in business district shall be turned off one hour after the close of business and or up until one hour before the opening of business unless otherwise approved by the planning board through site plan review. Right. So, so 24 hour places can stay lit 24 hours, right. but if you close, you turn your lights off. Right. They aren't attached to the building. Right. And if you are a car dealer and you feel that you need to have some special um, consideration because you want motion detection to be able to go on in the middle of the night, you could also get that through planning board approval. <coughs> the way it's written. Okay, so any more public comment on this one? Well, just uh, I, I think it addresses concerns that residents have who live so close to the uh, commercial district and feel affected by you know, light pollution and all throughout the night. So I think it's a great attempt to address some of those concerns as well as energy saving concerns. Mm -hmm. the, this, uh, this says, unless otherwise approved by the planning board through site plan review, so that would encompass security concerns and that kind of thing. Right. So mm -hmm. there, I don't get there'd be any need to spell out with an amendment, you know, what those possible security purposes? No, it could be any reason. So, in, in any much reason. of the lighting ordinance is that way. If you want to have something different than in, in the ordinance, you can apply to the planning board and say, mm -hmm. "Here are my circumstances. Mm -hmm. Can I have that?" Oh, and I'm sure the police department could come in and say, "Listen, we're having such a hard time with these car dealers. We like you to let them leave their lights on because uh, you know, make a case for that, and the planning board can do it." Okay. Then, if there's no more comment, a motion to close the public hearing on this one. So. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And do we have a motion on this one? I, I, would move to send it for the, I would move to send it for the positive recommendation. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I would second that. Okay. Any other discussion? My only discussion was that we do make a point of soliciting the intent of this department's thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Then all in favor? Aye. 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 And then the next one, uh, we have a public hearing to open for, is to amend 350-10.10b, detached accessory apartments. And that was referred to us on September 4th. So do we have a motion to open that public hearing? So moved. Second. Second. All right. Okay, we're open. So Carolyn, you want to talk about this one? Yeah, so um, we have a so we have um, two provisions for accessory apartments. One is a by right accessory apartment if it's part of or with incorporated within a single family home. The detached accessory apartments are um, by special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. And um, they still need to meet the same standard setbacks, and they've always had to meet standard setbacks as a principal structure. Um, when we revised the ordinances for three of the districts last year, A, B, and C, um, when we moved tables around, the reference to the setback was um, eliminated because it was in one section of the ordinance but not in the special permit section. So this ordinance sort of goes back and clarifies what's always been the rule, which is that the principal 
the, the, the principal structure and the detached accessory structure have to meet the same setbacks. And um, so it's just adding a sentence within the special permit um, section that specifically um, addresses detached accessory apartments. And it would say the building commissioner may issue a zoning permit authorizing installation and use of an accessory permit within existing or new owner occupied single family dwelling. And the Zoning Board of Appeals may issue a special permit authorizing the installation and use of an accessory apartment in a detached structure on a single family home lot when, and this is the additional se um, sentence or phrase, when such structures have the same setbacks required for principal residential structures and, and then the rest of it continues on the way it always was. <clears throat> so, our sample public, any comment? On any comment on this one from, from uh, the assembled public? Yeah. Any comment on this from yes. ordinance members? So, for example, if you had a garage and you wanted to convert it, but it was five feet from the property line, this says you can't do that. Right, and it's never been the case. Never and that's the way it is in all the other residential districts still in the tables that we haven't messed with. Right. So, our RSR and um, I guess those are the only two other residential districts we haven't um, modified yet, yeah. but that's the standard there too. But well, what you can do is, is work within the same footprint. Not for residential use, no. You can't convert a non-residential use to a residential use if you don't meet the same setback mm -hmm. as for a principal structure in that district. Because mm -hmm. yeah, detached garages and things are what, like four feet or something? Right, Very so close. we have much closer, right, for, for, for a garage structure. Right. So those you can't convert. Right. But you could build new, or if your existing carriage house or what have you, garage, was the setback in that district, then you could convert that. And then this would be? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put, you could convert that garage into anything other than a garage? You, you could convert the garage to a residential accessory unit. Yeah if it met the setbacks for residential units in that district. Yeah. But we typically allow workshops, garages, any sort of accessory structure, sheds, to be closer to property lines because there's no living component to it. So the question is for the, for the garage that is, you know, four feet away from the property line now. Yeah. If, is there anything that the resident can do with that piece of, property the structure. Beside, that structure besides a uh, garage uh, storage so not right they can't right. convert that into a right. living unit or and it's work, never been that way or so workshop or right. you know something yeah. other okay. right. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay so it still requires a special permit right yeah. okay. any more questions on this one and last call. Any more public comment on this one? What's the name? Okay. Our second. Excellent. All in favor? Aye. And then a motion? Move uh, possible recognition. Our second. All right. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Excellent. Okay, we'll get that one done. So now the moment you've all been waiting <laughs> And uh, mm -hmm. so I'd like a motion. <laughs> to reopen the continued public hearing um, from June 9th and July 16th. And this is on 350G, replacement of the moratorium for seven more units in B and C. Um, and 350H, replacement of the moratorium for construction of seven, seven more units in C. So the three more units. Move so to reopen the public hearing. Second. Just the Second. Second. Okay. Um, and before before we get going on this one, I want to let you know <clears throat> that we're going to spend some time discussing some of the new amendments that the yeah. good counselor from Ward 3 has come up with based on the meeting he had. But we have been asked by the housing partnership, what you, uh, yeah. we've been asked by the housing partnership to continue this issue to our next meeting because they want to put a position together on it as well. So in all likelihood, we'll discuss um, what Ryan is going to pass out tonight that came from that last meeting. But we will continue it one last time because the housing partnership wants us 
to take input from them as well. And how they somehow missed this, I don't know, but we'll honor that. We'll honor that request. So, um, what I thought we might do to start off is let, because this is, I think, new information to many people, uh, is to let Ryan explain what his proposed amendments are, and then we'll open them up for public comment. And uh, but please do remember, we're probably just going to be continuing again until our meeting on the twentieth. When we'll hear the position of the housing partnership. 13th. October twentieth. What? The thirteenth is a holiday. Oh, it is. Yeah. Columbus Day. Day. So it'll be the twentieth, but that will give you even more time for. Does that mean it's going to be here instead of council chambers, or? Um, we don't know yet. It, it, we it may be at five over there if the uh, no. Social services is that day. Oh, I thought. It is going to be the twentieth. It will likely be at six thirty. Unless Councilor Navarez chooses not to have a meeting because she just had a meeting. I guess she'll have just had one previously. It will be the 20th. So, um, okay, Councilor, you have the floor. Do you okay. want to explain the, and, and I'm assuming this is new information. I mean, it may be something that you saw at that meeting that Ryan had a while back, but we'll let you explain it and then we'll take on it. Thank you very much. And um, I, I might also add that the Energy Commission is also taking an interest in the energy part. Uh, of this ordinance, and, and as Carolyn knows, they, they may do have some feedback to provide in this period before our next meeting. Uh, so just to put that out there as well, but I'd like to start by describing the, um, the two-page document. Um, this is one that went to the forum earlier in the month, you'd be familiar with. It's a simple reorganization amendment. Um, its purpose is to clarify and make this ordinance easier to read by grouping it into sections. And the sections, as you can see, are buildings and parking, streets and roadways, park space, environment, energy, affordable housing. And other than that, it makes no substantive changes, it, but it groups all the different bullet points, of which there are many, into these um, five sections so that each can be discussed uh, more readily. So that's what that means. Um, building on that, I I have three here that I, I have discussed with the planning department, and they kind of build off, you'll see that I use my own, it's presumptuous of me, but I use my own headers. Um, um, the, the first one simply maintains the moratorium to the end of the year. Um, I think when we enacted the six month extension, a lot of people thought that meant the moratorium was here to stay until the end of the year. And there was some confusion when we spoke of simply replacing it with these recommendations. I think, I think these recommendations for a special permit, um, for a special permit application are coming along um, and we're making progress on them, but I think we should still maintain the moratorium to December 31st, not remove it. And as a practical matter, I just point out that I don't think anyone's going in the winter anyway. So um, that's why I recommend keeping the moratorium December 31st. Mm -hmm. this so essentially, this ordinance would become effective. Be exactly. That would be the same. The effective date would be next year, mm -hmm. rather than the moment we pass it. Um, the second amendment I'd offer is to the park space. Um, as you can see, it, it increases the amount of, of park space that was contemplated before from a minimum of 100 square feet to a minimum of 150 square feet, or the increase would be from 10 square feet per dwelling unit to 15 square feet per dwelling unit. So it just says there should be more park, uh, park space. And secondly, it says all of this park space should generally be contiguous unless there's a really good reason for the planning board to waive it, so you don't have a bunch of mini parks that you aggregate together and to, uh, you know, to meet that requirement. You have as much contiguous open uh, park space as possible. That's what that is. Um, third amendment is, uh, there's two parts of it that relate to streets and roadways. I'll just read it, that'll be the simplest way to explain it. Um, it adds on number four which reads, vehicular, vehicular access shall connect to surrounding streets as appropriate to ensure safe and efficient flow of traffic 
within the surrounding neighborhood and to mitigate increases in traffic on nearby streets. And to me, this is um, a tool the planning board will have to help make decisions um, to do exactly that, to mitigate increases in traffic and ensure the traffic flows effectively, which I think is an important thing to do. And so it was something that was discussed in the forum earlier this month. Um, the next one is, has to do with pre-existing paths that have been historically used as bicycle pedestrian trails. It asks that they, when, when, when possible, they be preserved and marked with signage. Um, and that was another specific suggestion that came from the forum uh, earlier. Quick question, is that section be a new section? What I'm working on, that's a good question, yeah. Um, and to, to clarify, that's so why I was saying I was being presumptuous. I was sort of amending my own amendment, which hasn't passed yet. Um, but yeah, I grouped all of the amendments and, and the first two-page amendment. I grouped all the points that have to do with streets and roadways into B. And yeah, and then I added some more. Oh, that's part of the reorganizing. That's part of that reorganizing. Exactly. So, so I don't know if it's a matter of procedure if it's possible to amend or keep it here, or, or whatever your pleasure. Well, I think what I might, because these have not been to the solicitor, I assume. I, um, you can copy on it, but yeah, it's safe to say I don't have been there. Right there. So it might be, since we have the luxury of not having, you know, of this, and uh, Mike, we uh, preface this by saying that we are going to continue this to our next meeting because the housing partnership wanted to weigh in in the meantime, and they don't have a meeting until the beginning of October. So the seven or more zoning in B and C is going to live another month. You know, we're, we're continuing the public hearing tonight. We'll continue it one more time. And uh, so th these might be things, and I know Carolyn, it might be nice to get the planning boards, I mean, because we have the time, get the planning board to weigh in on this, get the solicitor to weigh on, in on this, and decide how it would get integrated if we, if we so, you know, amend. Well, my only question on that is, that's if I can ask a question, would we have to reopen the planning board? Not because um, we amend it. You know, we might be just looking for their opinion because they're the sponsor. So I'd be very interested. You know, I don't want to cut them out of the process because they've done a lot of hard work on this. And I always feel bad if, if they get the feeling that ordinance sort of willy nilly chops up things that is their purview after they've seen it. Especially if we have the time to send it back to them and say, what do you think? But if they give us positive feedback, I just be at that point we could put it in there. Um, and I, I don't know, Carol, do you have an opinion on this at all as to how they'll feel about it? Um, well, these things, I don't think, I think they're just, I look at them um, as sort of more tweaks and, and further. And substantive um, changes. Right. <clears throat> so I don't think there would be an issue, and I, and I don't think it needs to reopen a public hearing. They finish their public hearing, but they can always, you can always seek feedback from any committee as you're doing with the housing mm -hmm. partnership and decide whether to take their comment or yeah. not yeah. so you know we can certainly take it as an administrative or a, you know just an agenda item that's not officially a public hearing but just a comment okay just a comment on it because we're still certainly doing public hearings and if we have ended here then it's getting public here um, so public comment time that that's the new stuff we have for you tonight but feel free to comment on anything you want about the previous version of the ordinance or the amendments or anything you, you'd like to comment on at all. Madame Lafarge? <laughs> well, essentially it means, it means, yes, exactly, knitting away while the heads roll. <laughs> essentially it means that the, the council won't vote on this now. I mean, there was some idea that out of here would come some recommendation and the council could vote to either continue or discontinue. The, the, the council, right. yeah. Now they won't vote till October. Not till yeah, after our meeting January. in October. Okay. Yeah. And our goal was always to get this done by the end of the year. So I would hope, 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 please, planning and everybody, that we, we get this out of here at our meeting on the 20th, which gives November, you know, just four meetings for council to to get this through, which I think is reasonable given all the process that's happened at this point. But um, that would be our goal to get it done and passed. And if it's not effective to the beginning of the year, that's probably okay. Um, yes, sir. So um, 
So I, I have a few. Oh, just for the for the my name is Jim Dash of eighteen ninety two award three. Um, so um, uh, first of all, um, I'd like to thank Ryan and for Gina Louise for holding the hearing. That uh, that that uh, that that was actually the first hearing held on the zoning by City Council uh, or anybody on City Council. That. Uh, all of the other discussions on zoning had been held through the planning department uh, and through various committees uh, like the ZRC or uh, the, through the planning well, we, there's, but there's we had two public hearings prior to that. that through ordinance, through this committee. Yeah. But I, in terms of just having a, right now we're, we're very restricted to talking about this particular ordinance. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the, those other meetings, the, the, there's a much broader Mm -hmm. reach well and, and those two counselors are probably the most affect their jurisdictions are probably the most affected by this well so, which brings me to my present which is where, we're <laughs> most of, which is where most of the C is at least which is the most effective which is in four three four. so what I I'd just like to do a quick no 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 so um so Jim Nash a member of the ZRC um, and that um, we worked on the dimensional standards um, so the dimensional standards that got approved by City Council last year um, um, allow for 50 feet of frontage and they allow for um, a 75 foot of depth and but the lot still needs to come up with what is 2500 per unit per unit but it has to be 3500 square feet minimum for a lot to well if you multiply 50 by 75 you get 3750 right. for a single family house right for a single family so to start you need that much okay so but for, for the purposes of this what i want to talk about is just take a typical lot size um, and so this is to talk about how the zoning works right now. So what we push through with the 50 by 75, okay? But, so I, I took what could be a typical lot on like Forbes or just about anywhere in town, okay? With 75 foot of frontage and 80 feet in depth. And what you see, and I call this the receiving area, this is where you can build, okay? 15 foot, so theoretically, this is just about how it would look. Um, and on, on a property like this, you'd be allowed to put in two units. Most people are comfortable with that. And the reason it works is because it's, it's only 80 feet deep. The problem is that once we start getting around 100 feet deep, it still kind of works, but things start to break down. That you notice that the receiving area starts to elongate into the property itself, which is different from the traditional way that everybody want, is expecting our zoning to work. They're expecting that it's gonna be nice and green and everything's gonna be up, and, up if on the street. Instead, what's, what's gonna start happening is that we're gonna start having infill deeper into the lots. Now, this is only 100 feet. This is very typical throughout Northampton. They have this kind of frontage and this, this kind of depth. I, I'd say a majority of the properties are this or bigger, okay? Um, now we're starting to get into properties that are typical yet large and these exist throughout the city we we know them we we walk by and say oh there's a great house look at the great backyard that they have and that we see through it you'll see um um florence bay state um uh between prospect and elm street in fact many of the properties on elm street they all start to fall in this range and that so we're talking three units that are allowed by this dimension many start to get up into this 150 range um I, if you just open up the the um the zoning maps from the planning department you know look at bay state look at look at florence 
especially any of the properties outside of the immediate downtown Florence area, just two streets out. If you look at, um, here, I'll just want to read you a quick list of the streets. These are URB. By the way, this is URB, not URC. Um, in Florence, North Maple, Lake, Beacon, Nonatuck, South Main, North Main Street, Oak, Sheffield, High Street, in Bay State, Hinkley, Warner, Winslow, Federal. Um, in, uh, then there's Massasoit and Crescent Street. There's North Street, there's Henry Street, there's Orchard Street, there's Montfield. Now, this is a list, the survey I've done in the time while waiting for you guys to go through your first part of the meeting. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I could do a much more intensive search of streets where these kind of properties, these especially, where we're starting to look and do you see the receiving area? It's no longer what we're thinking of as Northampton with a home up here on the street. We're inviting infill into people's backyards. And, um, and that I think that before, I think it's critical that as this moves forward, that we keep our eye on this. Because this is, this is, you know, if we do a nice overlay at Lyman, people are gonna be happy, all right? If we, if we, with the bigger projects, we're gonna get a lot of people showing up and people will be involved. But it, if something goes in on Hinkley, or if something goes in on, you know, North Maple, the phone calls that are going, going to come in when how did this guy get away with putting five units this is a street of single family homes and maybe two family homes and the thing is this is what we're allowing this is this is my backdoor concern with the new zone so I'd like to see this on the table as this goes forward Thanks. Thanks. Carolyn do you have any comment have a comment on Can you move this up there yeah. for a second? And you have any particular comment? Um, I, yeah, I mean, we sort of we looked at um, the whole idea of addressing these core neighborhoods is to say we need to grow more sustainable, sustainably. We know where um, we know there's demand for all sorts of different units, and the place, the appropriate place for those to happen over the long term is where we have existing services and existing infrastructure. It, it reduces costs to everyone, environmental costs, infrastructure costs, mm -hmm. costs to the city. Um, so there are some lots that are of this size. Um, there are many lots as we went through the analysis last year that aren't this size but yet have two and three families so they're non-conforming and you could never do that again on different lots that might have the same size um, so the um, again this piece less than seven units isn't on the table for public hearing tonight but we certainly looked at that and we said as a community if we we're going to grow uh, or if we're going to provide housing. In fact, we haven't grown in population, we've declined in population, but where we need new and smaller units and where the demand is is walking distance to downtown, Florence Center, Leeds, and that kind of thing. So um, the other piece of it is there's still the 40% open space, the, the um, lots that um, Jim mentioned are in the urban residential B, which require 40% open space. So in fact, you're not going to be building in that entire inner lighter urban area because you still need to meet 40% open space. Those meet 40% that I've drawn these out. These are, you know, based on, you know, I use some graph paper that, that the setbacks actually are the open space and that, that there's a certain point where the open space requirement will impact that receiving area but it's gotta be a significant amount of property. Um, the, yes, what's on the table is seven or more, but I wanna emphasize that seven or more is a political number. It's not a number based on any planning recommendation or any, anything that came out of the, 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 the ZRC. We came up with different numbers. We were talking about for, for URB, we talked about three or more. That's, seven was just to make this whole thing you know, to divide it up and be able to get it through. And what I want to get on the table is that, yes, we're talking about four units here. 
There's a there's a property across the street from Alex Giesland. It's a it's an acre big. We're talking 17 units across the street from Alex Giesland. I think he'd probably have something to say. And that the 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 number of properties that so the threshold for 17 or more or uh, for um, seven or more is is around 17,000 square feet. There's lots of properties that big. We know of those properties. You walk by them and people have big gardens in their yard and they have a big porch out front. So I could have kept going. I, for brevity, I stopped. But I, I could definitely keep going and I, I could draw up any number of these things and I'll, if the, any counselors who want to sit down with me and I can. But the, the receiving, and I don't want people to think that that the receiving area means that you could cover that entire thing with a structure. You still have to accommodate parking, you still Right. I mean the things that have to go in there, all of it But it removes all the green space. So within these formats right here, mm -hmm. that uh, within the first three, uh, a driveway actually doesn't impact the, the amount of the receiving area. It's only once you get up to this this larger area that now with the receiving area has to figure out how to accommodate a driveway mm -hmm. which and is part of the reason it works with the smaller properties but you still have to block out parking for the requisite number of yeah you got to put in days. parking you got to put in a driveway mm -hmm. you know, but this is that entire area is transformed it, it's transformed yeah. it's no longer a garage and a, and a garden in back mm -hmm. okay. um, council um, Thank you for making these illustrations. Um, as you go left to right, it sounded like you were kind of okay with the one on the left. Well, I think it's it's in, on the far left. It indicates like like how how we got to the zoning that we have, the dimensional standards that we have right now, kind of work for right there. The problem is that within Northampton, we have we don't have our properties. Many of them are actually quite deep. Oh yeah, so sorry, I don't mean to So on streets where the properties aren't deep, mm -hmm. the new dimensional standards work. Okay. So on the left So like that could be Forbes or Washington. So on the left you're kind of okay with what's on the left. And as you go over you're less okay. So I'm wondering where where exactly is the line? And then where the line is drawn, what is the fundamental quality that is, is the problem? Is it just the number, the sheer number of units that we put there? It's, it's the, the stock, it, there's gonna be a whole different way of, a type of infill going in on these properties. They're not, we're not gonna get a traditional four, a four family up on the street. We're gonna get something long that extends deeper into the property. And that, so for somebody on Massasoit Street, where they're used to looking, sitting in their backyard and looking over and seeing their neighbor's yard, they could see three or four more units extending into the yard, and they lose the privacy of what was their backyard. So, okay, so it's the number of units. It's not just the number of units, okay. it's the way it affects the, the private space. The, the private, so public space is up against the street, private is behind the structure it's where the backyards you know it's where patios will be for condos and all of that kind of stuff by have by allowing this sort of infill we're going into backyards mm -hmm. and not just the backyard of, you know of said property owner says I'm going to build everybody around him is now affected okay thank you and just to let it tell us who you are for yeah sure there. Jane Potter 42 close place and I think specific because I know you probably want more specifics Ryan um, in addition to what Jim's talking about the concerns are public safety traffic flow um, parking infrastructure of streets width of streets they're all different um, I think you've seen a couple of letters to the editor this week about the changing culture of the neighborhood um, someone else wrote about um, just the, the walking in the streets, a land planner, Dylan Sussman, about how you know um, people don't walk on the streets in his new neighborhood because the sidewalks are in such bad condition. But it's about it's about the culture of the neighborhood, traffic flow, parking, access. Uh, Mike, would you pay attention? Yeah, um, 
Counselor Murphy, I realize, <clears throat> okay, I think what you said about Madame Lafarge here <laughs> is, was out of order. <laughs> and, and you probably owe her an apology. <laughs> Well, I will, I will assure her we won't take off any heads tonight. It was a reference to the knitting. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yes, that's, that's, well, that's where it came from. She's yeah. knitting yeah. up here. So. Well, the well, heads I, roll. I'm well, not well, a fan. I'll give, <laughs> give you six points. Uh, uh, yes, please. Jim, would things like some of those Elm Street design standards that we've discussed, it, discussed with Brian address some of these concerns? Because they get into patterns of lot coverage. Um, proportionality of, of the post structure versus the ones around it, massing issues. And it seems to me that starts to get at some of these concerns. Um, structures that are much higher, perhaps like two stories, three stories higher than the ones in the day around it, things like that. Um, is that, that design standards, standards could off? be a way I I I think there's I think there's two things. There there could be the design standard discussion. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the more fundamental discussion that needs to happen is, do we want to grow like this? And I don't think anybody in Northampton gets that this is how we're going to grow. Because if we're going to grow that way, Adam's right, we need some sort of plan as to how this is going to happen so it's not like the planning board's got to think it out every time. Oh, uh, we had, you know, they don't know, and it's not clear in here what they're going to do if something goes in on, you know, and, and please give us your correct identification. Uh, Claudia. Represent <laughs> Claudia, Claudia Lasco Lafarge, Forge <laughs> 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 Valley Street. Well, I think you know Ryan. What what he's got up there is what exists on the left. This is what it looks like a, a house on on the lot with these setbacks. Um, and and then in response, Carolyn, to um, to your comment, you know, people. Yes, the idea of infill is to. I think. We're very conscious of sustainability and people living downtown and stuff. But what does it doesn't it doesn't speak to the issue of at some point these things will happen and people will be driven out of Northampton completely, not to a suburb or a suburb or whatever, but because you just the the environment that brings us here has to do somehow with this viewscape that is more green around us. And so I feel like the, the challenge, you know, is to find a way to keep Northampton's viewscape very, um, very, very friendly and, and, and also green, you know, while also infilling. I mean, I just look at this little infill project on the corner of Pomeroy Terrace. I don't know if people, uh, Ryan came and Jesse came on this walking tour of our neighborhood, and there is a detached condominium set and all this green around it, which doesn't make any sense to me to have the green army. But, and it's not an affordable place. It was like $500,000. So somehow, no matter what the language is that we're, you're <coughs> behind it, it, it doesn't feel like we're translating it into, into what's on the ground for people that we understand. And that's why, Jim, this is very, very helpful because I think, like a woman from home who owns a property on Holly Street came walking by and started talking to me about zoning. And she has a three story on Holly Street, those lots, they go back just like the arts trust building way back. She said, I guess I could probably put more buildings up on my lot as well. So I mean, there are these places where we don't, haven't even thought about this long, what it would mean to build that long. So thank you, Jim, it's very enlightening. Yeah, um, Jane Potter, 42 Hook Place. Um, and I just wanted to say that I completely agree with infill, but what we worry about, and I think that that $500,000 sale, I don't know who bought that, but a <laughs> um, little crazy in that location. But unfortunately, what it does um, offer as a portent is that we're not, the diversity of the neighborhood is going to change. We, yes. we love this neighborhood that has all kinds of apartment buildings and has had creative infill happen already with beautiful old houses turned into rooming houses and apartments, and they are affordable. Um, and any new development, unfortunately, if there's, if, in case we get specific language around it, um, it's going to gentrify the whole area. Uh, and, we're, and it's going to change the demography of it, too. It's just going to be older, rich people. Um, and we worry about that. Adam? Uh, I wonder if another way to pull together some of the concerns here is when you get 
uh, larger projects, seven or more units, to increase the open space requirement. Because I think, you know, one of the things that certainly I'm, I'm worrying about as I'm looking at Kim's charts is like, you're just going to wind up really eroding the tree canopy in the infill receiving areas over time, which is not in a sustainable North plan. And so, one way to counteract that and I think mitigate the visual impact of these larger projects is to say, well, you need 50% open space if you're going over seven units. Um, and that start to, might make it look more attractive and more acceptable to the neighborhood and really start to counteract, push back against some of those problems we've identified. Oh, oh please, yeah, you haven't had a chance to speak yet. <laughs> um, I'm Julie Carros. I live at uh, 30 Monroe Street, um, which is Ward 4. And, and since I'm the only Ward 4 person here, they're very accepted. So I, first of all, I, I just want to say thank you, Ryan, for um, clearly the, incorporating a lot of the neighborhoods concerns um, that, that came up at the meeting that you ran um, a few weeks ago uh, with these amendments. And, um, and, and the work, a number of us at, at, in Ward 4 who have been uh, talking and meeting about these issues are, obviously we're particularly concerned about the development of the Lyman estate property. So I, I just like to, and that's, you know, that's a seven plus, um, that would be a, seven or more unit um, development potentially. So I just want to echo, first of all, what Adam said, that I think um, a, a big concern is is that the density that would be allowed is is just too great for the neighborhood. Um, and you know, and that, that's the traffic concerns. Um, our streets are already overloaded, we feel, with, with traffic. Um, that would just increase the traffic. Um, and, and also I think specifically the, in the seven plus um, ordinances, the height allowance is, I, I think it's higher than it should be. It's 50 feet. Um, and also the, the, the square footage allowance, I just think allows for too much density in, in an area that's been, you know, it really is one of the most beautiful green space, it, well, it's actually not that beautiful right now because of the way Smith treats it, but it's um, potentially a beautiful open green space close to downtown. Mm -hmm. All right, any other comment at this point? Again, remember that we'll, oh, oops. Thanks for listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And anything I can do to, you know, further this discussion around this concern I have, mm -hmm. let me know. Mike? Yeah, I'd like to thank, uh, I want to call it Commissioner Ryan. <laughs> Your Excellency will be fine. <laughs> I'm sorry, thank you or something like that. I thank you for, oh, thank you. for uh, being responsive to, to the ideas. Thank you. And what, one more comment over here? No, Gary, right. Okay, Carolyn, you had the? I, I do, actually. I just did one. Oh, please, go ahead. Uh, Jane Potter.